Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and more specifically, welcome to the Armoury. This is where all weapons from Halo lore will be featured and analysed in detail. And in this episode, we look at the Energy Sword. Let's begin. The Type 1 Energy Weapon Slash Sword, or T1EW-S, commonly known as the Energy Sword or Plasma Sword, is a traditional Sangeli close quarters weapon. The Energy Sword is intended to express its owner's personal skill, clerical honour, and combat viability. The Energy Sword is a signature weapon of the Sangheili, and has been their chief weapon of nobility since its creation during the Ages of Discovery. The Sangheili pride themselves on their skill with the weapon, which they regard as holy and believe that it is better for a Sangheili to fall on his sword to redeem his honour than to die dishonourably. The Sangili are very strict on who can be trained in the art of swordsmanship. In civilian life, only aristocrats are permitted to wield energy swords. Sword wielders are not eligible for marriage, though they may breed with any female they choose, married or otherwise, to ensure successful transmission of swordsman genes. Within the Covenant military, use of the energy sword is not restricted to aristocrats. Sangheili miners are generally not permitted to wield the sword because of the high regard in which it is held, though exceptions have been witnessed. It is unknown whether this extends to majors, as at least one has been witnessed using an energy sword. Stormtroops, ultras, zealots, generals, special operations, stealth troops and honour guardsmen commonly use energy swords. The energy sword measures 126.8cm or 49.9 inches in length, 3.8 centimeters or 1.5 inches in width and 50.1 centimeters or 19.7 inches in height and weighs 2.36 kilograms or about 5.2 pounds. The energy sword's design is seen as the logical evolution of an ancient lineage of traditional Sangheili weapons, most notably the twin scythe and the curve blade. Superficially, the twin scythe's influence of the energy sword's design is unmistakable. Technologically, the energy sword succeeded an older type of Sangheili sword known as the burn blade, which was used in the early years of the Covenant. Modern energy swords are manufactured by the merchants of Kikost, a prominent group of arms makers from one of Sangheili's moons. The energy sword consists of a curved hilt, which houses an energy storage and generation device, as well as the blade projector that forms a blade of superheated plasma stabilized by two magnetic field generators built into the handle of the weapon. This forms and contains the oval-shaped ionized blades for which the weapon is recognized. The weapon is powered by a small battery that supplies power to the plasma generation device and magnetic field generators which generate and contain the plasma needed to form the blade. The battery's energy is reduced for each successful strike. Each strike from the sword will drain the battery by 10% of its maximum energy output. Once the battery power is fully depleted, the sword will deactivate unless recharged. The horizontal hilt forces the wielder to use a punching motion to stab, rather than a thrusting motion of most knives and swords. Mass-produced energy swords feature a roughly W-shaped hilt and have little variation in blade design. Specifically, some models have more rounded blades in lieu of the more common angular design. However, more drastic variations do exist. For example, Arbiter Reaper Morami's matching pair of custom-designed swords had basket-style hilt guards and radiated a high degree of ionized plasma, whereas most energy swords contain the blade's plasma with great efficiency. Some Sangheili Special Forces units wield blood-red coloured energy swords which, ironically despite their colour, burn hotter than the more common models. Arbiter Thel Vadim's personal sword, the Prophet's Bane, was pale salmon coloured and had a wider blade compared to the mass produced swords. Some energy swords contain a fail safe mechanism that can permanently disable the weapon if the Sangheili wielding it drops it. When dropped, the fail safe engages by deactivating the magnetic field before dispersing the plasma. The plasma then consumes the handle and thus destroys the weapon. The fail safe is included to prevent enemy infantry from acquiring the weapon and using it and gives insight to Sangheili tactics. Each energy sword is marked by its creator and first owner, but often their legacy is forgotten. The known variations of the energy sword are as follows. 
The Blood Blade is a red coloured energy sword used by certain special operations Sangheili, such as the Silent Shadow. Red bladed energy swords are sometimes used in the UNSC Wargame Simulator, for example in Infection Sessions. The Ravening Slither, a blade with a deep blue hue and green hilt. In wargames this model can be swung faster than other energy swords. It is likely this variant is only a simulated variant within wargames and doesn't actually have a real world analogue. The Vorpal Talon. In October 2558, Fireteam Osiris, accompanied by 031 Exuberant Witness, discovered a copy of the Vorpal Talon in an area on Genesis that they passed through on their mission to rescue Blue Team from Cortana's Cryptum. The blade's exact properties are unknown, however the weapon was later integrated into wargame simulations for use by Spartan Fours aboard the UNSC Infinity. The Vorpal Talon in wargame simulations is a named variant of the energy sword imbued with various upgrades from two thruster evades between cooldowns to increased jump height, longer stabilizer duration, increased lunge distance, and a built-in motion tracker that retains its visibility on the user's HUD even when using SmartLink, mirroring the built-in motion tracker of the Nornfang SRS-99S5AM sniper rifle. Described to be virtually weightless when its wielder uses it with unrestrained malice, the Vorpal Talon has a maroon handle and an orange to cyan gradient for the main blade colouring. These perks and features have nothing to do with the weapon in question and are simply additions made by technicians when inputting the weapon into war games to give the variant additional perks to test Spartans against foes with higher situational awareness and greater mobility. The Prophet's Bane is an ancient sword of the House of Vadam, dating back to before the ratification of the Writ of Union and the establishment of the Covenant. Formerly known as the End of Night, the sword came to be recognised by its original user as more than a warrior's tool, but a weapon that possessed the warrior's heart. The blade was highly treasured and stored away to serve as a reservoir of glory and honour that can be redeemed in times of great need. Following the aftermath of the Human Covenant War, Arbiter Thel Vadam recovered the sword from the House of Vadam's vaults. Unusual among Sangheili, the Arbiter reforged and upgraded the blade in a way that apparently preserved its honour and history, but changed its destiny. Upgraded in the traditional Sangheili manner in his clan's own forge, Vadam insisted for the blade to incorporate components from the Type 1 energy sword that he used to assassinate the High Prophet of Truth during the Battle of Installation 00 in 2552. Like other Sangheili relic weapons, the Prophet's Bane was not named by its wielder, but rather by other Sangheili, as Vadam's blade became a known instrument of change and self-determination across the Sangheili colonies. Following the sword's upgrade, the Arbiter wielded the Prophet's Bane to slay his foes in the conflicts that followed the Covenant War, including the blooding years that engulfed much of Sanghelios. Umdama Keep variant energy swords manufactured by Umdama Keep in 2558 burned less intensely, thus making it harder to cut armour, but caused more grievous injuries and not cauterizing wounds. These swords took advantage of the Sangheili Code of Honour to make every wound a death blow, as Sangheili who wanted to retain their honour would often commit suicide. The green infected variant is used in some wargames infection matches, this model features a dull green blade that transitions to an inky black near the basket hilt. Despite its appearance, it otherwise functions like a standard Type 1 model. It is assumed the aesthetic appearance is simply artistic merit for the sakes of wargame simulations on board Infinity. The Type 1 energy sword is an extremely devastating and powerful melee weapon when applied during close quarters combat. A single strike can even penetrate the energy shield system's armour and flesh of a Spartan or Sangheili. This is due to the design of the weapon, which utilises ionised gas rather than traditional shaped solid matter because the energy sword lacks any solid material in which to hold or impale anything. The sword does not cut or carve in the traditional sense, but rather boils anything it comes into contact with. The Type 1 energy weapon's edge is therefore extremely volatile. Being able to slice through even the toughest of metals like a hot knife through butter, including ODST battle armour and the Titanium A class plating of UNSC destroyers. Injuries caused by the weapon are often gruesome. 
Stab wounds by the energy sword are, in most cases, fatal. As the blade passes through the body, the organs and tissues are cauterized by the extreme temperatures produced by the blades. Body fluids in the area of the stab wound are flash vaporized upon contact. Organs within the area of the stab wounds can suffer life-threatening damage dependent upon which organs are struck. The effect of fluids trapped in organs or arteries and the expansion of heat could lead to ruptures or small explosions causing additional damage to the victim. Survival is minimal at best, and in the case of non-lethal strikes being administered, proper medical treatment must be applied as soon as possible to ensure the permanent survival. Because of the weapon's sheer destructive damage, common forms of fatality to victims include total impalement, loss of limbs, bodies being bisected, and decapitation. The energy sword's most glaring downside is that it is purely a close quarters weapon. Any combat engagement outside of the effective range puts the wielder at risk. It is for this reason that the Sangheili approach sword combat on the battlefield in two different ways, by funneling the enemy into close quarters to allow them to strike, or to apply a form of stealth using both technology and technique. Without these, the user is vulnerable to attack by all forms of ranged combat, especially from sniper-based counter-attacks. Infantry with overshields are also more resistant when facing this weapon as it can take two strikes before the shield system fails, and then another for a killing blow. Furthermore, the energy sword is vulnerable to magnetic fields, as they can block, disrupt, or possibly even alter the functionality of the sword. Two energy blades clashing together create a small disruption of energy as a result of the same type of magnetic fields clashing together. This clash has a small area of effect splash damage that can affect the combatants. As with most other Covenant weapons, the Type 1 energy weapon is battery powered, requiring the user to either recharge the weapon or discard it when the power is depleted. Although the handle can generally be used as a club, the energy sword's combat effectiveness at that point is minimal. Last but not least, the Type 1 energy sword can sometimes expose the position of a Sanghili warrior employing active camouflage due to the weapon's energy output. The energy sword is a quintessential Sanghili weapon. It is sleek, elegant, and extremely lethal, and as such carries a reputation on the battlefield that strikes fear into the hearts of any adversary of the elites. To quote Thelvadam, a noble and ancient weapon, wielded by the strongest of Sanghili, requires great skill and bravery to use, and inspires fear in those who face its elegant plasma blade. Nothing gets you begging for mercy and frozen in fear in the same way as being run through with an energy sword. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stalker of the Realms, and Falcon X003, the Holders of the Mantle, Black Biscuit, J Rabbit, Austin, Kaiser, Silux, Reclaimer216, The Revanche, Wolf Slim, Andre, and Samantha, my Reclaimers, Zach, Deep Cover, Verbal Statue, Spesigo, Spartan A498, Guppy, Josh, Bastion, Mulchar, Nightride, Sierra G059, Kenneth, and Dylan, my Metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome, and all of this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo Lore Discuss to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.